Kevin, uh, did the president know you were coming on the big show this morning so that you'd have to answer for his comments on the Fed? You know, I spent the whole break thinking about Squawk Valley. You know, you could put Leesman in a cowboy hat. We could call you Hoss. You'd look so much better. Uh, All right. But, you know, we I mean, we respect the independence. I know, we respect the independence of the Fed. But the president, but do you, you know, think the president's brand, he speaks his mind. You know, but of course, we respect the independence of the Fed. That's why we appointed such great independent guys. All right, I'm going to move off of the should he yeah. be doing it to whether or not you think he's right. You have wages going up 3.2 percent. You're going to crow in just a minute. I'm going to let you crow about the 3 percent growth this year. Mm -hmm. Do you still think we ought to have a zero real Fed funds rate? You know, I, I again, I don't want to get out in front of giving the Fed advice. The thing that I can say is that when you and I were talking about the tax cuts last year at this time, I said that if we pass them, we'd get a capital spending boom and that a capital spending boom puts downward pressure on prices because it's a sh supply shift, right? And, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the data. So we've had a capital spending boom uh, for independent businesses is up 16% this year. If you give us the fourth quarter, which was related to the tax cuts, we're up about 10% uh, nationwide. And that's the kind of thing that puts downward pressure on prices. And so I think the Keynesians thought that if we got 3% growth this year, then you'd get all this Phillips curve stuff and inflation would accelerate. It's clear that we've had the growth with inflation actually maybe in the last three months decelerating, which is exactly yeah, what our yeah. model said would happen. So it's going really according to plan for us. Kevin, let's talk about your model, which uh, I, the 3% growth is a given this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many doubters about next year. The, the street doesn't appear to believe you. The Fed doesn't believe you. The World Bank, everybody is mm -hmm. below that, some more substantially than others. Uh, do they all have it wrong, or, or yeah. is there some other uh, it's just thing like, they're missing here? Yeah, it's just like last year. And, and there are really two factors that I want to point to. Uh, the first is that there has been this capital spending boom, which you've talked about, we've talked about. About. And the thing about capital spending is it gives to GDP twice. You get it when you buy the machine, and then the machine starts right. to produce output. And so we're going to get that output next year. The second thing is the capital spending boom, you might have noticed in the third quarter, it kind of leveled off a little bit. Uh, we were looking at the data a lot to try to figure out what was going on. And if you look, there are a lot of capacity utilization problems. So, for example, in computers and peripherals, capacity utilization is almost 90 percent. And, you know, that's not a sustainable rate. That's way above Ke normal Kevin, capacity. So those guys have only... to buy machines, though. Those guys. So yeah, that's the I, second I, part. I, I, I got to cut you off only because the graphics being put up are not working out with what you're saying. What we're what looking graphics? at are business spending numbers year over year that are the growth rate is quite a bit down. And mm -hmm. if you look at the month over month, guys, which is the bar chart, it looks pretty squirrely the last three months. So it's a little hard. To, and the street is also a little bit pessimistic about this, quote unquote, capital spending boom that you're counting on. Well, you know, I'm happy to email you the sources for all this. I was referencing the GDP data mostly. But the fact is that the latest advanced durables number, you're right, uh, was a surprisingly low number. And my guess is it's going to reverse itself next month. But again, with capacity utilization so high and everything having gone up so much this year that it seems like the people who make machines are going to have to buy machines themselves, so that's going to help feed this positive cycle. And so we're definitely going to be, you know, at three or above three for next year as well. Kevin, does it bother you that uh, stock buybacks have been surpassing CapEx, or is there a certain fungibility to buyback dollars versus CapEx dollars? Well, I think there, there are, again, two things. What, one thing is that there is this big stock of cash that was overseas, and people can bring it home now. And when they bring the cash home, one of the things they're doing with it is repurchasing shares. Now, if you repurchase shares, like, say, Apple is, is a, you know, a company that's done a lot of that, uh, then what happens is you free up capital for new, innovative companies. So what you would expect to see, if you think the repurchases are a good thing, because because they reshuffle capital to the people who need it the most is a big surge in capital spending by independent businesses and that's up 16 percent this year so it's all working really the way it should be. Kevin looking at your economic forecasts into 2019 how are you modeling for China and trade policies between the U.S. and China? Yeah you know, it's a great question because right now that's one of the places where our outlook has changed a lot. Uh, the European economy is clearly slowing. Uh, I think the European economy is slowing because capital spending's on hold as people wait to see what happens with Brexit. Uh, there's a lot of financial distress in Italy. And of course, Europe exports a lot to China, which itself, I think, is suffering a severe slowdown right now. And so the global economy outlook, the global economic outlook is a little bit uh, lower than we had last year. But for the U.S., we're really humming along. Kevin, what's your expectation on how the slowdown in the housing market, particularly when it comes to equity growth, is going to affect the economy heading into 2019 with people perhaps feeling less wealthy than they might have? Right. Well, well, that is that is one factor that we're watching closely. You're right. Uh, the housing market has been one of the weak spots this year. 
And I think that if you're wondering about the, the sustainability of the boom, then the fact that we don't have this out of control housing sector with runaway price increases, it should actually give you comfort that we're not, we don't have to worry about our financial institutions having another housing bust, right? Because the housing is really underperforming. But I think that as we move forward and incomes continue to grow, you know, we've got real wages growing more than 1% right now at an annual rate, then those higher incomes will increase housing demand. And I expect that to turn around next year so. Kevin, does labor represent a constraint on growth in this economy? If you look at the participation mm -hmm. rate, uh, which is something, by the way, the president c complained a lot about as a candidate. He also complained about the large number of Americans, 95 or 96 million people who were out of the workforce or not mm -hmm. in the labor force. And that number has actually grown under, under the president. Um, is there a constraint on the extent to which this economy can grow because we don't seem to be able to grow the labor force much more? Well, well, hypothetically there is, Steve, but it's one of the things that we've been following the closest since I've been here. And uh, we just tweeted a chart at the last jobs report that's one of the most interesting charts I've seen since I've been at CEA. And what it is is we, we looked at all the people who got a job in the latest month of data and then asked ourselves what percentage of them came from out of the labor force. And so we're basically, you know, getting people back in. They're, they're uh, re-participating in society. And the answer was 73.5%. And that's the highest percentage of new jobs going to people who were previously out of the labor force that we've seen in U.S. history all the way back, as far back as we calculated. And so I think people are coming back, but you're right, if that were to slow down, uh, then that would be one reason why we'd have to maybe have a less rosy scenario going forward. Kevin, you sound like a man who thinks that not only are we not at full employment, but maybe there's more slack in the labor market than uh, is expected. Well, I think there's more slack because we're seeing it, that people are coming back into the labor market. But I, and, and again, remember that when, when we took over, the ex, everybody was extrapolating a trend of really declining labor force participation. So even leveling it off and getting flat is a serious accomplishment relative to trend. But yes, I, th I think that there's that, and then there's the fact that we've got a capital spending uh, boom going on, which means that you don't have to get runaway inflation, even though we have the unemployment rate very low, because the supply shock is putting downward pressure on prices. Kevin, I, I am not going to ask you if you uh, support the administration's trade policies here, which is what everybody always wants to ask you because we know what you said before. Here's what I want to ask you. Do you get to tell the president that he has done so much to help business spending and capital spending with the tax cuts, but that the uncertainty created by the trade uh, and the tariff wars uh, are taking away from confidence. We have seen some decline in some of the CEO confidence surveys we're looking at, and that one policy of the administration is working against another. Do you get to advise the president on that problem? You know, I'm not going to talk about my conversations with the president, Steve, but I can tell you that I do support his trade policy because he's trying to push tariffs and non-tariff barriers lower all around the world. The OECD did a study of what happens if we reach the long run object objective of fair and reciprocal trade, and it's a big increase in global growth and a disproportionate increase in U.S. growth because we're relatively disadvantaged in these trade deals. But I agree with you that uncertainty over our progress is something that's clearly having an impact on markets, and that's why I think it's important that we move forward quickly, for example, with the China deal that's on actually like a running clock right now. And, and I think that we all recognize that if we make positive progress, as we have with Korea, as we have with USMCA, as we're doing with Europe, you know, if, if we make positive progress with China, that that'll be very, very positive news for markets.